So hello, I'm Yuri Cataldo. I am a co-founder and general partner at Athenian Capital. Um, I also am a research scientist at Autodesk, and I focus on the business side of emerging technologies, so everything from Web3, AI, to the metaverse, um, and looking at where the company could potentially go in five to 10 years, and how we can make you know, money in the future. So I'm Jean. It works? Yeah. 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 Okay. Like this. So I'm Jean Arnaud, and I am uh, I am the co-founder of Nova. And with Nova, we are uh, trying to to build an AI that is able to accelerate the research process. Uh, so this is my first ad. My second ad is that I'm building one of the biggest community here uh, in AI. We are at CIC. It's called Ethos, and we have now. Uh, more than 40 startups in our space and uh, AI startup, and more than 200 members, and we're expanding in Berlin, so in less than six months. So it's very successful. And uh, the last thing that I'm doing is I, I am an artist and I'm exploring all the new technologies, so uh, the metaverse, the, the AI, so yeah, it's fun. Awesome. <laughs> um, I just spoke a couple minutes ago, so you guys probably know me, but Jesse, uh, CEO of Trustware, tangentially interested in... Uh, uh, now let's get into it. So um, first thing, wanted to ask you guys, first question, ensuring fairness and transparency in AI systems through blockchain. Let's talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about what, what you guys are seeing in this space. And maybe start with you. Okay, so we, ha we have a lot of uh, ethical problem linked to, 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 to AI. And the first thing that you um, probably heard like 100 times, it's, uh, it's about the, the bias, right? So. Um, we cannot avoid the bias uh, in AI, but what we can do is try to minimize them. Uh, we, uh, you probably heard about the, the story about the Apple credit card in 2019, uh, where uh, the limitation, the credit limitation was not the same for women and men. Uh, so this is the kind of, of things that you can find in AI and very easily, uh, discrimination. Um, so how we avoid this? So I guess that in the model, you need to plan diversity but this is not easy. So the things that I want to say is that most of the time we think AI as a fixed model, but it is something that is in constant evolution and that, that, that needs to, to, to grow with the different insight from people. So, yeah. So, uh, so one area where I've noticed a couple of things happening is actually in clinical trials for drug development. Um, and so I'm, I'm on the board of a, of a new CRO that's kind of working on this, but what's happening now with uh, the use of AI is you can rediscover or reuse drugs that were thrown away through clinical trials uh, so they can fit a better subset of individuals. And so what's happening now is a better uh, advent of personalized medicine. So there's a company actually working on this. I'm not affiliated with them, but it's uh, care.trials. And they are util utilizing Web3 in the way that it should be used, uh, which is to create a safe, secure, transparent way for researchers who are using clinical trials and drug development to find better subjects that may not fit the traditional you know, white male type of uh, setup when the, when the, you know, the higher ups actually usually do clinical trials. And so what it does is individuals from around the world can come together, opt in, and there's an AI system that explains exactly what they're opting into. And so if you go through a pharmaceutical company, they're not gonna necessarily explain to the average person. And a lot of people feel like they're a statistic or they feel like they're being like, uh, tested upon. The way they have this set up is the exact opposite. And so they use AI systems to explain in ways that the participant can utilize. They also can increase the diversity of participants by focusing on a, a wider you know, range of individuals. Um, and because it's a Web3, native Web3 place, um, again, the individuals, their, their data is secure. They get to decide who gets access to what parts of theirs, and they know they're not being preyed upon by traditional systems. Yeah, that's. So I think one of the things that I take away from that is uh, along the lines of the origination and authentication as well. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at things that are cross-compatible uh, cross across different ecosystems, especially in the healthcare side, I think that's one of the things that we, st we talked about originally, and that's very interesting. I want to really touch on that and one of the key points that we had lo looked at, which is the validity and source um, of data. So um, Yuri, do you have any other thoughts on that in terms of, the, in terms of validity and source? 
Yeah, so we talked a little bit about, um, and I think there's a longer, this has actually been, I think, coming up multiple times today about the election, um, you know, a lot of memes and, and different types of uh, misinformation that's coming out there. And so looking at the validity of sources, and actually I actually love there was a startup earlier today that was pitching about this, was absolutely phenomenal. But the idea of, again, we all live in our own bubbles. Uh, we have different sources of truth and things that we believe in, leave into, but having a single source of truth where things are kind of stamped, um, again, I really love what that startup was doing. Internally, at like larger companies, it's less of an issue because we have multiple systems in place where we sort through, there's again, people whose full-time job it is to sort through our data, to, to you know, quantify it, to categorize it, to find out what's true and what's not, to get rid of the duplicates. But when you start going to the a larger area of like open source, or even again, what's happening now in the political arena of uh, different types of information and different demographics, particularly, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm from Indiana, uh, my parents are, are aging boomers, and there's a lot of things that come across their desk that they will believe as truth because they have a different kind of filter. They're not used to questioning a lot of things. And so having some kind of stamp of approval will help with this kind of, I guess, re-education of, of us asking critical questions of like, just because I saw it on the internet doesn't mean it's true. And how do I see with my eyes and believe my eyes. Yeah, a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth way more than that, <laughs> and then what happens when the video is a little wonky and, right. yeah. What are yeah. your thoughts? So, different things on, on this topic. The first one is that, um, as a poison can be the remedy also, uh, this is the same thing with AI. AI can spread the, 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 this misinformation everywhere, but it can be also used to, um, uh, spot the misinformation. So my company, uh, Nova, was, was, was basically doing this when we, we started to, to accelerate the research process. We went like, oh, but we should also uh, provide to the researchers something that, uh, a feature that can be a, a detector of a verif a verified information. Uh, they tried to, to attach it, but... You don't work. Nope. You're, you're good. Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. So this is this is something. So for example, just 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 some numbers. Um, when AI appeared in the research papers, we came from two million a year to five million a year. Can you imagine? So second of all, um, if you if you, I'm, I'm sure there is some researchers here close by MIT and all of this. So um, when you when you, when you do your, your, your research, sometimes you will quote a paper. And this paper that you quote, you quote it because it, it was quoted by many persons. So the value of the paper is a quote. But it doesn't mean that it is better. Sometimes it, is an, it has been retracted from magazine. And you don't know it. And you continue to quote. So that's a big problem. And it, it, it was very difficult with my company to, 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 to manage this problem. We, we, we still didn't figure it out because, first of all, we were like, but how we define what is true or not? This is a philosophical problem, and it's always like this in technology. You have a philosophical problem, and you need to translate it in technology. That's very difficult. So what ensures you that you have the truth or not? Sometimes just perspective. When we discuss, there is no truth, it's just perspective, and we build the truth. Uh, um, so that's very interesting for, for this point of view. And after we were like, but we have some criteria of verified information. And when we mix all these criteria, maybe, we don't define the truth. We define what is reliable. Different. Very, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> I, I, I've never really thought about it in that way, and I think that these types of discussions really start getting me onto the more theoretical side of things. But one of the things that we did talk about before that re le that leads right into is the value of human uh, oversight when we're dealing with AI, right? If you're looking at truth, what does that actually mean, and what is the combination between essentially the human side and the uh, and kind of the AI side, the automated decision making, et cetera. So um, thoughts on that? No? Yeah. OK, so there is something. I, I was at MIT uh, like three days, uh, three days ago, Media Lab, and there was a really, really uh, great panel uh, about uh, interactive AI. So 
interactive versus generative AI. So first of all, you can use generative AI in interactive mode, right? So you, you probably all uh, try this. You use ChatGPT, simple prompt, and it's garbage, literally, okay? Yeah. So if you are in education and your student did that uh, with a simple prompt, you're like, no, this essay is not good. It's logical, but it's not good. So, um, so th that's the problem. You need to be good at prompting. And you need to be good uh, how to, to interact with AI, to build something, something meaningful, something deep. So for example, when I'm writing an article, um, I'm not doing it in, in English in general. I'm writing it in French, and I'm translating in English. And after, I refine the English. That's the, the first thing. So it is an interactive manner to use the AI. Same in art. You can just play and roll the dice. You have uh, pictures. But is it art? I don't think so. What makes it art is the effort, is the construction with the machine. So if you put, for example, your first drawing and put a nice prompt, you have an, a, a picture that really looks like it, the same thing that if you drew it, but after you can just take it back and, uh, and improve it like manually. This is, this is what it is interesting with AI, this interaction. But just to come back to my, to, to my MIT thing, um, they are working to build real interactive AI, especially in music. So for example, you, have this, uh, you can jam on an AI and the AI will adapt in function of what you're playing. So it is the AI is really uh, a, a person, kind of, uh, with who you can interact. She adapts, or it adapts, or he, <laughs> whatever the pronoun, and you adapt also. Okay, so it's, it's really interesting. I mean, that's, I, I think when we talked about this first, it was the way that all of us kind of agreed on one thing, which was it's, it's in conjunction with the AI that makes something beautiful. Yeah. Um, but I want to touch back on what you just said about it's, like, it's almost like a human, right? and go into uh, something that you talked about, Yuri, which was checking biases, mm. right? With, uh, like, like, essentially yeah. that, that part, because it kind of ties into the human yeah, side. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, so, you know, as humans, we are, all of us have some kind of biases built in. Whether or not we're, ob we're obvious to us or not, they all are. It happens a lot with, um, you know, people who are also building out these different uh, algorithms. The, the Jean gave a, an example of what happened at Apple. There's numerous cases that, like, Amazon, where they were trying to fire, uh, do a faster way of, of hiring. So a bunch of engineers got together, and they set up this new HR thing. And all of the, the people who set this up, these engineers were you know, white men who went to prestigious universities. And so they used their own resumes as the training data. And so everybody who came back like, looked just like them. And everybody else was rejected. It's just because that's what their training data was. And they didn't realize what their bias was because they didn't check it. Um, and so there's a lot of human interaction that has to happen that checks all of our biases. One thing that uh, we're doing at Athenian is we're, gonna, we're doing the opposite. Um, so again, VCs, we, we are trying to look for patterns to make an outsized return. And so you look for obvious, what can be obvious patterns to what is already one. We have created our own um, data model that looks at founders in different areas, predominantly about their um, opportunity. So it looks at their um, whether or not they they have, are, are, have a uh, it gives them a resilience score, it gives them a score on their uh, interest in their own projects, as well as how their teams are reacting, um, as well as their persuasiveness, because there are some key elements with founders, particularly at seed pre seed stage, uh, where you have to look at some more we'll call them like less tangible ways, yeah. and it allows us to find startups that don't fit the obvious mold of like, did you, again, did you come out of MIT? And I'm, I'm happy to say that because I w went there, but it's like, come out of these obvious places, and it gives a more wider field. Um, part of what caused my co-founder and I to do this is, so again, I'm from the Midwest. My first startup was in Indiana. No VC would ever look at me, particularly my real background is in theater. So I used to work on Broadway as a designer. Nobody's going to look at a, uh, someone who lives in Indiana with a theater background who's building this tech startup. Never going to happen because uh, I don't follow the average pattern. Uh, exactly. Um, so yeah, so like finding ways to check your balances, either using an AI system or you being the human in that is very, very important, and we're seeing that more and more and more. Yeah, I mean, I, and I don't know. Uh, we, 
we deal with a lot of VCs, and I don't know a single one that, I, that I've ever looked at that looks at that type of criteria. So props to yeah. you for kind of reinventing <laughs> it and also doing it for a personal reason. Um, we talk a lot about AI here. The last thing I want to say uh, on this subject is like what, we, what we're looking at kind of is from, from both of your perspective or from both of your you know, examples is like garbage in equals garbage out, right? And so that kind of brings, I think, one of the big, big things that I, at least I see blockchain being able to do, which is ensuring yeah. data quality, yeah. right? If there's a, like a validity or a stamp, as you had said before, what does that do so that we understand where this data is coming from or we understand what we're training with? Um, so yeah, wanted to get into that. Agree, yeah. uh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to say that like, so the, I guess the, the main key thing here is, um, I know we're at a tech conference, it's very much blockchain focused. Like blockchain is not a, not a panacea, it's not gonna solve all mankind's problems. Same with AI. It's very much important to think of these as tools and whether or not they're applicable. And so like in this instance, if your data is correct and it's already good data, you can then verify it. But blockchain itself won't tell you if it's good or bad, no. but it can tell you the validity of it. So particularly if you're not using like some internal structures where you've created it yourself. So I think so there's a good, some good points of that as well as like, you know, it's just realizing it has its limitations and you can't just say, well, we did a blockchain solution, so sold. Yeah, so it gave you history and, yeah. and origin of data, which is good, for example, uh, in art again. So I will, I will take uh, the, this example. You probably heard about this. This artist, he, he did uh, the, this art contest and he won the art contest with AI. Um, yeah. His name is Jason Allen. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, after the, 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 the people in the competition asked him to retract his, uh, his work, but he wanted to sell it. Um, and uh, that was where uh, came the problem of copyright. So, and the problem of transparency also of the model. So he, he tried to, to, to go in court to try to prove that he, he built it with different, uh, with this interaction. But how you can measure it without the blockchain? With the blockchain, you would have been able to tra track the history and say, okay, there is 50% AI, but 50% human. And after you can discuss about AI. Oh, I did it with the AI. But you have still your 50% of human. You can discuss. But um, just with this uh, AI tool, they just took the picture and say, oh, no, we don't know how uh, mid-journey uh, is functioning. This is not transparent. Uh, this doesn't belong to you. And we will not have this discussion now, but just a question for you. This is when we can ask ourselves if, because of AI, we are forced to rethink our classic paradigm. For example, do we need to have a copyright? Why a copyright? So for example, I, I will have ideas from this panel or from your discussion. I will come back home and I will write an article. Will I quote you? No. <laughs> No, no, and I'm sorry just because I, maybe I don't know your name or just maybe because at the end of the day, I think that it is my idea and we are all the same in this. I'm sorry to say that this way, but it is true and we are quoting in, um, when we are doing our research, when we have something written that we can verify, but I can tell you, my first job was to be professor in philosophy. I can take you Pandar from a Greek word and Nietzsche and have the same, same sentences just because he translated, but nobody could verify this. <laughs> so you have this kind of problem already, but we didn't have the technology to verify it. That's true, and maybe we should stamp that exact quote onto an <laughs> NFT so we have it immortalized <laughs> in time, right? Yes, um, yes. I mean, but in addition to that, so yeah. like if you extrapolate even further, like look at, so Microsoft right now, they're making all their money doing on co-pilots with people. Uh, so, and I hear this all the time at the corporate level because we're building our own large language models. You guarantee that like one of our customers does not want to see their design show up on their competitors, customers. And so like that's internal data. We're trying to figure out how we deal with it. I don't know how Microsoft does it, but they're like, is trying to, Microsoft is trying to run the world with their co-pilots. But I can guarantee you if they had some kind of office disease system internally that could verify like, Listen, as you, if you're one of our customers, I guarantee that your competitor is not using your data and your models. Like the, you know, the constant joke we use, so I also work in AEC, it's like, give me a, 
light version of Zaha ID's design. And so you can have like Zaha ID knockoffs happening all over the world. They're like this phenomenal design firm um, and they have a very distinct style, but it is replicable if you start breaking it down even more. So how do like these types of, of companies, and I know we talk a lot with architects about this, of like with their distinct styles, not showing up on someone else's buildings and without being attributed or even like, you know, leaking accidentally through our system or through another system. So being able to stamp that is a huge deal uh, with trust and transparency, uh, which all companies are like terrified of like, it takes, you know, forever to build your trust but then a moment to lose it. So if a large corporation suddenly loses that trust, no one's gonna use them and now they've just killed them themselves. I think it's, a, it's an incredible point. And when you look at kind of the way that things are going with, with the adoption of these systems into the corporate world, just want to ask those like thoughts about kind of the barriers. I mean, we're kind of in, in overtime here. We've answered most of the main questions, but what are you guys thinking about kind of the next couple of years and what we're going to be seeing here as well? Oh, so my, my fear, and, and it, it comes just right away from yesterday, so I didn't think really about all of this, but I met one of my friends, and he's working with live AI. I didn't even know that it existed, this. So he's showing me this. So you take your phone, and you prompt, and at the same time, the space is transforming. I can take his face and start to speak with his voice in live. So it's, it's much more, it's, it's deeper than, than the deep fake. It is a live fake, really. Uh, so I, I see like really uh, good things about this. Like if you, if you try to create with a voice, for example, multimodal AI, you, you speak with a voice, your, your, your uh, painting is changing, and you write at the same time, and you use all the, the possible channels to create something in a real time. But if you, if you misuse it, that's, that's a disaster. How many people could, could use it to ruin, ruin your reputation in five seconds? Usually, I, I'm doing, I, I told them, I'm doing the, this presentation, the show, with me, my avatar behind speaking. And at the beginning, you have this really philosophical discussion, and suddenly he's saying whatever he wants. And I'm like, what are you saying right now? And it's me. How do you recognize that it's not me without the blockchain technology? Yep. And this goes way beyond just moving the cursor every couple of minutes yeah. to show that you're online. Yeah. I mean, you're showing up to meetings and it's you, but it's not you. I mean, yeah. the implications are a little crazy. Yuri, I know you have some thoughts on this. Uh, sure, sure. So we talk about more like, like corporate adoption. It really comes down to like what the average person thinks is, is law. And so I, uh, at, at Autodesk, I spent years trying to build up our Web3 part of it. Yeah. Get, wrote a bunch of white papers, get presentations to the CEO, and then suddenly Terra Luna like, messed everything up for everybody. Because then that was a chain reaction, and they're like, no, our customers will never trust this, so it's dead. It's not even like things you can bring up anymore because it's so recent. So part of this, and, and it's, like, it's sad kind of watching some corporations drop this. Starbucks had a phenomenal... Web3 component that they didn't call Web3, but it was a way for users to interact and to talk about coffee. And then they gave you stamps, which are NFTs, but they didn't call it that. And that was a great way to do that. It came from their marketing department, not from their researchers. Um, or if you look at Dot .swoosh, Dot .swoosh at Nike, still doing well. Unfortunately, Nike has fired all of their researchers uh, <laughs> who built that out. So I don't know what's happening on Nike's side of it. But it really comes down to... And I think it was either your keynote or another person brought this up. It's like, blockchain's going to happen in the background. They're not going to let their users know about it because there is this other lying sentiment about when someone says blockchain or Web3, they all make you think of crypto scams. And until yeah, yeah. Like, the whole oh, market true. shifts that, then other corporations are not really going to adopt this type of thing because it's not worth the risk. Now, if you say you've got an AI component, your stock is going up. Everybody loves it. I mean, that's not always going to be the case. But for right now, AI is the cool, sexy thing. Yeah. And Web3 is not the cool, sexy thing. Yeah. yeah. Except for us nerds here. Yes, so, exactly. Um, <laughs> awesome. I want to give a little time for questions. I know we're, we're, yeah. we're at the end. So, yeah, questions. Could you touch a little bit upon trademarking IP for AI? I was reading a little bit about it, and there was some issues around doing that. But is that something that's being pushed forward both, you know, in Europe and U.S. for, for you know, AI creation? I, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. That's not my thing. I'm <laughs> not a lawyer also, so yeah. I have no idea about this. Um, 
intellectual property. I know even less than them, so I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> on that particular subject. No, I, I never heard about this, to be honest. And I think there is, again, there is too many problems. He, he said it very well. I mean, there is too many problems with, with, the, with the data origins in a large language model that we are using. I mean, th this is why OpenAI is sued by New York Times, right? So um, when, it's com when it comes to intellectual property, when it comes to copyright, it's, this is a real problem. And, 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 and I don't think we will be able to, to manage it without the blockchain. This is, this is my real feeling, this. Uh, great conversation, guys. What are your thoughts on the advancements with digital identity um, and kind of how that's all going to come to play with this and data being the new gold? Um, you know, utilizing AI to kind of keep this open source. And for example, in clinical trials, right, you know, you can use ZK to mask a lot of the personal information and then smart contracts to verify these things so that, you know, you have these truly decentralized economies that are able to still share data and move the science along much quicker. But you don't have to take into account the copyright because a lot of the information may be not even seen. So what are your thoughts with that? Yeah, well, I mean, we were talking about this yeah, exactly on our setup of like proof of personhood, but I'll let you because you, yeah. I'll let you go under that one. So, I, I this uh, this is something I'm saying all the time uh, about like digital identity. I don't even know why we didn't have uh, earlier this conversation when the internet came, because all these I don't. Uh, does somebody have a, a big social network here? No. Like if you have, so for example, if you have a big Instagram, if you have a, yeah, Instagram m most of the time, you start to have a lot of uh, hateful speech. Okay, it's, it's, it's impossible to manage that. When you are harassed on the internet, I, I mean, it happened to me and it is a hell to get out from this, a hell. Um, nobody is really able to, to, to help you in this. Uh, the, the police is completely like uh, uh, out of the game in terms of technology, it is a hell. And um, so, so I don't, the only option for this is a di digital e identity. And this is a clear uh, use case for, for blockchain, this. So I, I think that the, the next 15 years, this is, this is something that will happen. We will have a digital uh, identity. And I think it is normal. We, can, we cannot dream about a world where we are uh, more free without the responsibility that comes with the freedom. I mean, for me, this is crystal clear, this. That's, yeah. that's an amazing way to end this off. Yeah, I, <laughs> I agree. Oh, yeah, go for it. Oh, sure. Hi. So we're talking about the biases, the different ones. And uh, as an international student, I've been living that and suffering from that, oh, yeah. uh, especially with the different, with my resume. Maybe because there, there are many, many steps. And the first step is the resume being analyzed by an algorithm. And my question today is how could we be fixing all these biases? I know that um, in machine learning, we're training the machine in a certain way. And as you said previously, we're giving inputs. And how could we fix the inputs? And how can we make the system better today? So I have an idea, but if no, you no, go, ahead, go ahead on this one. Yeah. So, so, so same. Um, so that's very good because my wife has been uh, in in the same kind of situation because she has a she has a Russian name, and uh, and I mean, because of the war and all of this, she's not Russian, but <laughs> uh, it, there there is a problem. And if you start to look at her CV, she's coming from Stanford. I mean, she she has an exceptional CV. She she talked at uh, United Nations, one of the five experts uh, who was uh, invited to. To, to, to write the, the uh, EU chart uh, for AI, so, and she's not able to find a job. And I'm like, how, how this is even possible, all this? So I hear you. And most of the time, it's because we are replicating in the AI system the, the same mistake that we did in our human world. So I don't know if it happened to you, but I, I was witness of this. You have this guy, yesterday he was uh, working at McDonald's. I don't have any, anything against people who are working at McDonald's, that's good. But um, yesterday he was at McDonald's, suddenly he's uh, HR in a big corporate for AI and is judging your uh, curriculum. So 
that's absolutely wrong. There is another way to do that. Uh, it's not to have somebody who was interviewing with all the bias, human bias, this time not artificial intelligence uh, biased, uh, but it is about um, giving an answer and you have the skills that will appear and that will fit to the job or not. So for example, if this is a model that we implement in the HR uh, AI system, we have more chance to avoid the biases. But if we, if we still keep our old school manner to think and to hire people, and we see that it doesn't work in our world, HR is a big, big problem, uh, we will not solve it. Yeah, so that's it. I think, think it's a human problem before. Oh, so definitely, so. yeah. So like, think about incentive structure. So again, I have a very untraditional background. Um, I just happened into a job at a corporate environment, but I applied for many, and I'll never get picked up because I have a weird, weird background. Um, HR is incentivized to bring on people that could fit a role. And when you write roles, and I've done many of these, you like write out a list of qualifications. And these are just ones that you are not just like guessing, but you're just like, based on other people I know who can do this job, this is what I think they should do. And that's like, it translates all the way down to an HR manager who then looks at this and says, well, I am incentivized to hire somebody as quickly as possible who fits this criteria, and they don't get creative. Even though there are many elements and phenomenal people who can do similar roles who don't have the traditional like A, B, C, D, 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 all the way down. And so you have to it's like start from the very beginning of like hiring managers, the people from the top down who are willing to look beyond the buzzwords that, that are created to hire people and to think like outside the box. It is difficult to scale in the beginning, but the companies who are doing it do a phenomenal job of bringing in talent from other areas. And these individuals are thriving and succeeding in, in other parts they wouldn't have because they don't have like, again, they don't check all the boxes. And so unfortunately now we're trying to get AI to do a lot of things. AI is not a human, it just replicates and looks for patterns and we're feeding it patterns that are not helpful. So you almost have to like scroll all the way back and start from something scratch and have like individuals who care about finding people and then let that be the new norm. But it's like, it's like again, it's a human shift that has to happen and humans have to get involved in this uh -huh. part. I, exactly. I, I mean, this is last thing I will say on this. Like, I'm in the position where I've been hiring both at the like centralized exchange and, and now, and I try to look for people that are go-getters above just like the CV. Like, one of my favorite things to do is on the first interview, just like take the physical piece of paper, resume, and toss it, because I've already read it, right? I know who you are, right? You you have the interview, but it's about like, can I see? And we've we've hired four in four different countries, right? We have six people on the team. Four different countries, right? And it's 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 like that's why I'm so attracted to what you guys are doing on the VC level. Yeah. Is because it's looking at the it's somewhat almost the intangibles and looking at the at the way that we can bring that in. Um, but I don't know how that gets extrapolated into the bigger AI system. But I I, I think that you guys are right about uh, about the human interaction there. 